Okay, good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bob Cavalier. I'm a member of the Union League Legacy Foundation Board of Trustees and I'm the current chair of the 160th anniversary of the Union League of Philadelphia. Welcome tonight to our program. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Legacy Foundation, our chair, Jim Dunnigan, I'm very pleased to present this night, night's program for you. It's the latest installment of our Jack M. Templeton Liberty Series. We're in store for a tremendous program tonight. There's such a buzz, there's such enthusiasm. Folks are coming up to me and talking, excuse me, talking about this tonight. And um, I want to especially acknowledge Steve Target, who is the chair of the Education Committee. And Steve made this all possible tonight. We've, we've been talking about the prospects and the excitement of having Mr. Woodson join us for an, a program and tonight it's actually happening. So congratulations to Steve Target and his committee for delivering this evening. Um, I, thank you. As all of you know, the Legacy Foundation provides dozens of programs throughout the year, the Liberty Series being just one of many. They also provide exhibits, they care for our arts, they are engaged in historic preservation of our league house, also of our guard house. They provide scholarships and overall education and spreading our mission. They are essentially shine a spotlight on the core values of the Union League of Philadelphia. Support of the constitution, support of the free enterprise system, the belief in the role of limited government, patriotism. The Legacy Foundation brings that all to light for our members. As many of you know, and it's so wonderful to see you here this evening, uh, we're engaged in a capital campaign right now and Kristen Moran is leading that charge. She's our new executive director and she's done a terrific job and I'd like to acknowledge Kristen this evening. So please bring a fellow member, bring a prospective member and attend other functions that the Legacy Foundation is putting on, including the new exhibit, which will be opening shortly. Before we begin our program, if you could all please silence your cell phones. You'll also notice that on your chairs, there's um, pens and pencils and paper. We're going to have a Q&A when the session is over. So please write down your questions. Look for a member of the Legacy Foundation staff, and they'll come around and collect your questions that we'll have for the end of the program. It is my pleasure now to introduce our speaker this evening, Bob Woodson. Bob is a native Philadelphian, a civil rights icon, as so many of you know. I, everyone here is intimately familiar with his work. We're thrilled to have him. One of the things that um, you know, Bob Woodson is gonna share is really his core values, which we all know completely align with our core values. And, I was asking him a few moments ago about the pin that he's wearing and it's for the, um, the 1776 United campaign. And I hope we hear a little bit about that, which pushes back on the, the 1619 narrative. We're also hopefully gonna hear a little bit about his book, Red, White and Black. And uh, we're in for a real special treat. So we're gonna have a discussion this evening. Our executive director, John Miko, who we are so fortunate to have for 17 years now. John will lead the discussion. And I know it will be um, thought provoking and um, really engaging. So thank you so much. As John and Bob make their way to the stage now, we're gonna have a little video presentation that you could see a little bit more about Mr. Woodson's life and his, the, all the good work that he's done. Thank you. My closest friends have letters in front of their names, like ex-drug addict, ex-gangbanger. Witnessing transformation in some of the most dangerous and troubled neighborhoods in America. These same young men who were fighting one another became ambassadors of peace. For 12 years, there was not a single crew-related murder in this community. This Christmas, I sit down with Bob Woodson, perhaps one of the most inspiring individuals I know. Founder of the Woodson Center and of the 1776 Unites Project, he's devoted the last 40 years to helping people in the most troubled of circumstances to become, as Bob always says, agents of their own uplift. 
We must take race off the table. America is in a moral and spiritual freefall that is consuming our young people of all races and of all classes. And the answer will come from the grassroots. But America needs a brush fire that will rescue this country from itself. And brush fires burn from the bottom up. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bob Woodson. Bob, welcome back to Philadelphia. Pleased to be back. So bo born in Philly, South Philadelphia, a couple blocks from John Aguilar. We're just talking about that. Um, I know many of you know uh, Bob and you know his work, but I'm going to do a little bit of a bio on you because I think it's well worth it for those that maybe, maybe don't. A veteran of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, uh, one of the great leaders, especially locally, of that movement. Woodson has been fighting for the civil rights and civil liberties of those most in need for nearly 60 years. He's founder of the Woodson Institute, an organization whose mission is to help residents of low-income neighborhoods address the problems of crime and unemployment. He's also founder of 1776 Unites, an organization that promotes the idea of those that those values expressed in our founding documents are values that are here for all Americans of all races and creeds. Again, Bob Woodson, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Pleased to be here. So this is only the second time you've been to the Union League. That surprises me a bit. I know you have a lot of friends here. We've talked about a few of them. We might talk about them again. But tell me about where you grew up, what, what your life was like as a kid here in Philadelphia. Well, thank you. I grew up in um, South Philadelphia, uh, 16th, I mean, 18, 18 Garrett Street, right between Dickerson and Reed. Um, and I was born in 1937, middle of the Depression, when Philadelphia was segregated, as was the whole country. But also, every, every our house, I mean, our street was like a small village. Uh, all households had a man and a woman raising children. Smith School was where we went to school. All three, third and fourth grade plays were held at night. And so that parents, working parents could attend. And if you came into the auditorium in the back of the table, there were a lot of lunch pails as parents went. We could walk safely in our community without fear of elderly people being mugged. I never heard a gun fired, never heard of a child being shot to death in their crib. Uh, on every corner, there was a Black-owned business. It was a healthy community where people were thriving, even in the face of segregation. We could not attend uh, a lot of the recreational facilities, League Island, the, the swimming pools or anything. But we also had our own businesses. We had our own theaters, the Royal Theater, where you could see Lionel Hampton and all of them was on. So we had a Black Wall Street in this city and all others. So um, it was it was a ple pleasure just to have fond memories of it. I couldn't I couldn't afford to live there now because there's Starbucks. A, a <laughs> I, I know we have a bunch of league members actually live in that neighborhood. <laughs> um, so you went you went you just told me something before uh, just earlier tonight that you were involved in the space program. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, well, just a, a little back, my dad um, was a veteran of the First World War, and he had war-related injuries, and uh, he died uh, when I was nine, even my mother with five children to raise and a fifth grade education, but she equipped us with the values that we selected good friends. That's why I guess I can appreciate why kids join gangs, because when you don't have a dad in the home, you need to find a way of a, an extended family. And I found it among my, uh, my, my colleagues. In fact, one of the guys, I, we, there's seven of us, there's three still alive. One of them you'll probably know if you're my age, he was Gordon on Sesame Street, Matt Robinson. <laughs> Remember the fro? Yeah. yeah. Well, he, we were in Cub Scouts together. His daughter is Holly Robinson, the actress who's married to Rodney Peake. So, so I understand, but they were a year older than I was. And so when they graduated, I was unaffiliated and you don't grow up in the neighborhood without food. So I quit and went into the military and Air Force. And uh, they, I was blessed to be 
trained in airborne electronics and I was stationed at uh, Cape Canaveral or Patrick Air Force Base and I flew Earth's uh, uh, tracking systems. Um, so we extended the, the, the missile range from 500 miles to 5,000 miles. So I was there for three years. And so had a lot of fun. So I wanted, I wanted to talk about your involvement in the 60s in the civil rights movement, the, the second civil rights movement. As we at the Union League know, the first great civil rights movement the Union League was a major part of in the 1860s and 70s. But that, that civil rights movement that we all know something about in the, in the 60s. But I want to also talk about, um, want you to comment on that movement, how it changed. And we're going to bring it up to the present. But let's start with your work in the, in the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s. Well, I was, I was really, um, as I said, when I was got out of the military, I went to Cheney University and graduated. But I, I took college courses when I was in the military at the University of Miami because they had extensions on their bases because of the segregation. I couldn't go on campus. Uh, so when I got out of the military and, um, and started to work, um, went to Cheney, graduated, went to University of Penn School of Social Work, um, I got active in the civil rights movement in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is Baird Rustin's hometown. And uh, it was really working as a young civil rights uh, leading demonstrations against segregation. Uh, but something happened at that time is that first of all, I was against force busing for integration. That got me in trouble with the leadership because I think the opposite of segregation is not integration. It is desegregation. The goal is pluralism. So that got me in trouble. I also led demonstrations outside of Wyatt Laboratory and, and on the picket lines were janitors, hairdressers, just ordinary people. And when they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And, and when we asked them to join our movement, they said, we got these jobs because we were qualified, not because of the sacrifices that you made. And I realized they were huge class divisions. And so I said, I'm in the wrong struggle because Dr. King said, what good does it do to have the right to live in a neighborhood of your choosing or eat in a restaurant if you don't have the means to exercise that right? So freedom is not just defined by opportunity. Freedom has to be defined by preparation. But the civil rights movement was not interested in spending time and energy preparing low-income people to walk through the doors of opportunity. And so when this happened enough time that I realized that a bait and switch game was going on. And that is the bait was you use the demographics of those who are most troubled as the bait and a switch occurs when the resources come. And this was the start of the great society programs which is what's devastated this country and devastated low income black communities but I, I can unpack that if you like. But uh, it, it really is, uh, so, so what happened is that a lot of the people who were civil rights leaders became politi politically active, elected to office, and they were the ones who administered the $22 trillion that the government spent on the war on poverty, where 70 cents of every dollar didn't go to the poor. It went to those who served the poor. They asked not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. So in essence, we created a commodity out of poor people over the last 50 years and wonder why we are failing as a society. Poverty among that group, uh, I think Walt, uh, uh, Thomas Sowell said, in the black community, poverty rates declined dramatically between 1940 and 1950, and again from 50 to 60. But with the $22 trillion we spent during the last 50 years on poverty programs, poverty rate remained almost the same throughout that whole period of time. And so, uh, so and it really undermined the, 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 the kind of solid communities I grew up in. And so, so that's why I've been a critic of the civil rights uh, movement when it morphed into a, a race grievance industry that it is today. It has lost its moral authority to function. And so I, um, I left the movement and worked on behalf of low income people of all races. We don't have a race problem, we got a grace problem. So, so let's go back to the Great Society and that civil rights movement. So the Great Society, can you define 
for those that may not know what we're referring to, what is the Great Society? What is that movement? Prior to the, the 60s, the responsibility for caring for low-income people res resided among each group. Each ethnic groups had their own society. Right here in Philadelphia is Mother Bethel Church, the first Black churches in 1786. Well, typically, Black churches would have burial societies where they would collect money because we didn't have insurance. They would also have their own welfare system where you were taxed a shilling a week. And, and, but you couldn't um, collect welfare if you were poor because of your own slothfulness or your own misbehavior. So we had standards that, that, that people had to meet even when we were enslaved and among free Blacks. Uh, and so that, that, but what happened, so the responsibility for caring for the elderly resided within the group itself. Well, with the, um, with the Great Depression, government intervened for the first time in the economy on behalf of helping people. But government support up into the 60s was from government to individuals. But a major shift occurred in the 60s where government shifted monies, not directly to people, but they invested in professional services. So we saw the growth of schools of social work, the association of, of therapists. You, a huge industry developed uh, where, where uh, millions was invested in those who supposed to be caring for the poor. What they did was they parachuted uh, uh, of solutions in those communities with the expectation that the poor would participate. There were two social scientists at, at the Columbia University School of Social Work, Claude and Piven, and they were socialists. They said, well, one of the ways that we can move the country towards income redistribution is let's, let, let's just uh, uh, create a, a financial crisis by really recruiting Blacks into the welfare system. Blacks uh, was stigma, welfare was stigmatized in the black community prior to that. So what they said was, if you can separate work from income, it will make fathers redundant, uh, drug addiction, dropouts would occur, all the, if you can just disintegrate the family. They were aided by the women's movement. The black power movement said that the nuclear family is is Eurocentric and therefore racist. So, so it's they, a conscious decision. A conscious decision a policy decision to, to tear apart and create a crisis by recruiting people in welfare. Um, uh, there's a book uh, uh, for, for Fred Siegel, The Future Once Happened Here. Fred documents all of this and he says that between 1970 and 74, Millions of Blacks were recruited into the welfare system as the federal government's poverty offices actively recruited. Let me interrupt, because you said something during cocktails. What were the intentions? What was the end game for that policy in, in the eyes of the policy? In the eyes of the policymakers is to create a situation where cities like New York went bankrupt at the time. It, it was a deliberate policy to force the country into income redistribution. That's what the leftists wanted to do, but they couldn't just do it by authoring a policy. You had the compl uh, complicity of the federal government actively recruiting people in the Black Power Movement contributed to it. Um, all of a sudden, they used to uh, social services used to require women who were pregnant out of wedlock to report to paternity. They said that that's a violation of the, their privacy rights. The ACLU got involved in filing lawsuits. So it was a combination of social uh, policy forces along with the federal government uh, enticing people to come and join the world. And sure enough, the family began to disintegrate. And we had 5 million Blacks coming into the welfare system in a four year period at a time when the unemployment rate for Black men in New York was only 4%. These are facts, you know, either we live with truth-based facts or lies become normal. Now, I was not gonna go here, but I'm gonna go here. And, and the federal government knew this was gonna happen. In fact, there's a report that's published right before a lot of this gets implemented that says, this is going to be bad for 
families, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's, right, right. um, and, and those of you who remember him, um, Democrat from New York, uh, working in urban issues. Talk about what he said in that report and what difference did it make? Prior to the 19, you have to understand it, 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 between 1930 and 1940, when the unemployment rate among whites was 25% during the depression, it was 40% in the black community. The blacks had the highest marriage rate of any group in society. Elderly people could walk safely without fear of being mugged and assaulted by their grandchildren. <laughs> and children were not assaulted in their cribs at a time. But this, this then changed when marriage began to disintegrate. And also our Christian faith also was what held, that was the glue that held us together. And so what happened was there was an assault on these value structures and, and, and the family. And that's what became it. And that's the big lie of today is that the out of wedlock birth that is now 70%. They're saying that's, that's attributed to a legacy of slavery and discrimination. It's not true. One of our scholars did a study of what was the state of the slave family after slavery. They looked at the records of six major plantations. 75% of slave families had a man and a woman raising children. So for 100 years from slavery from, from 1865 to 1965, the black family was intact. Um, and, and, and as a consequence, it was a bulwark against the kind of decline. But all of that changed in the 1960s with the poverty programs masquerading as being uh, treating welfare and, and welcoming people on. And it has devastated the, uh, the, the community today. Um, and so that, that's how we got to this mess that we're in tonight. So let, let's talk about the work that you left the, the more formally, as we understand it, civil rights movement, continue to do civil rights work for American Enterprise Institute. You worked for um, other organizations, founded the Woodson Center. Initially, it wasn't called the Woodson Center. It's called the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. And, and that's because we believe that the answer to the problem is to, uh, I had enterprise in the name because I believe, and we believe that the principles in the market economy should apply to the social economy. In the, mar in the market economy, 3% of the people are entrepreneurs, but they generate 70% of the jobs. And entrepreneurs tend to be C students, not A students. <laughs> A students come back We got back a lot to of C students out there. <laughs> listen to me, listen to me. A students come back to universities and teach, C students endow. <laughs> you know why? Because smart people have to have all the answers, and by the time they make a decision, the opportunity is gone. <laughs> See, C students are able to act in the presence of their doubts and uncertainty. And they also are able to fail and bounce back and come back. I know some venture capitalists won't finance any entrepreneur who hasn't failed at least once. In fact, one of my favorite uh, uh, entrepreneurs is A.D. Gaston. He was of Alabama's first black millionaire. E.D. Gaston made his money because Blacks were kept out of the insurance industry, and so he ran around and collected all of the money in the churches of burial societies and formed his own Black uh, 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 company. He had a sixth grade education. A.D. Gaston said, it's better to say I is rich than I am poor. <laughs> <laughs> and so taking that, 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 that paradigm into the social economy, because right now the social economy is dominated by top-down structures. And so what we do is that we take the principles of the market, we go into low-income, high-crime neighborhoods, and we ask the same questions that a venture capitalist asks. Not how many people are failing, because you don't learn anything from studying failure except how to fail. So instead of going into the households of the 70% that are raising children that are dropping out of school in jail, we go into the 30% of the households where the children aren't dropping out of school, they aren't in jail. 
to find out what is going on. And there is the source of social entrepreneurship. These are people who are in poverty, but not of poverty. But no one ever, left or right, no one ever goes and studies the success. These are the entrepreneurs. So what we do at the Woodson Center, we go into these neighborhoods and we look for people who are achieving against the odds. We recognize that 10% of who we are is defined, I think, uh, by our external circumstances, how we were raised, whether it was abusive, racism. 90% of who we are is our attitude about the 10%. And so these grassroots leaders that we go in and we look for them, and once we find them, we're like venture capitalists without capital. <laughs> we we have to you know beg with dignity and 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 go out and recruit capital. But we know we also know that an entrepreneur, a venture cap entrepreneurs tend to be poor bookkeepers. And so what venture capitalists is who invite not just capital, but they also invest in training and managerial assistance. Am I right? So that if a person is operating in their garage, they can become a Fortune 500 company because a venture capitalist knows how to grow a, a venture so it grows along a continuum. Too much money can suffocate it, too little can starve it to death. So these principles that operate in the market economy, we recruit people with business experience to join with the people who know how to prevent people from from, from um, changing their behavior, transforming them from being predators to ambassadors of peace. And so that we have started small, we had a, a, a five young men, they, they know the streets. Once your character changes, your characteristic has an advantage. So they said, well, okay, we used to be gangbangers, now we're entrepreneurs, but we can deliver pizza in the street because no one's going to rob us. <laughs> And so we connected them with Domino's Pizza and they had a thriving business. Uh, and so that's, that, that's an example of how you take the principles in the market economy and you apply it to the social economy. And, and you've done work all over the country. All over. And you've done work in Philadelphia. Yes, sir. And we were talking earlier about one of your friends, one of our- Herb members, Lusk. Herb Lusk. And you've worked with, you worked with Herb. We work with Herb, help him raise some capital, but also help him train some of his his uh, grassroots leaders. Uh, and doing, doing exactly the and kind doing of exactly the kind of community building from the inside out. Um, and, and 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 so that's what we do. So there's a, a school of thought um, from the schools. Uh, it's an academic theory that the what's happening in the inner cities is so broken that there are so many problems, that the churches aren't what they used to be, that the civic organizations aren't what they used to be, that it can't happen simply like that. It's, it's not reasonable to expect these communities to, to kind of be uplifted from within. It has to come from without, right? From some other place. Why is that not true? Well, first of all, people who don't believe things can happen need to get out of the way of the people who are doing it. I can, I can sit here and tell you, give you endless examples of how value has been created. In 25 years ago, in an area called Benning Terrace in, uh, in, in Washington, DC, there were, 20, there were 55 murders in the five square back area in, 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 in uh, two years because of these warring factions, the avenue and the circle, and everybody was perplexed. I worked with five, men who were ex-offenders, who God had changed their hearts and they became healers. And I was training them in gang intervention. And I said, but you have the trust of the officials, but you have the trust of kids on the streets, but there's no way to measure your impact. So why don't we find a neighborhood so we can take your influence into there? And a 12 year old boy was killed in this area and it was, all over the paper. I said, God has made the choice for you. Go up and bring those warring factions to my office. So they went out there and because they were trusted, uh, they brought 16 of these young men in separate vans. They had bulletproof vests on. And I had in my office downtown and I had a table food because kids will fight when they're drinking together but not when they're eating together. 
And so we, we sat them down to the table. Long story short, the kids said no one ever asked us to be peaceful. But they, because of the trust, we, we earned the trust of these young men. And within, after the third meeting, we said to you, are you happy with this life? They said, no, we'll be given. So they said, yeah. So they, they shook hands. The leader of the avenue became a foreman. And so the leader of the circle and they switched and, and they were giving jobs, repairing the very community they tore up. And so the, if you look on the press, you'll see them removing graffiti. They removed more graffiti in, in six months than the housing authority staff did in three years. And once they began to have pride in rebuilding, we said to them, it's, we've done this for you, but what you have to give back. And they wanted to be coaches. So then they reached out and they became coaches to 150 kids in that community. We didn't have a single gang related murder for 12 years. And, and that became a model that we have taken to different cities it demonstrates these are the toughest and the roughest kids in the world. But if you can just get the right moral mentors and character coaches and equip them to go in and lead these young men, they're not going to be preached into changing. Because I really believe a, a witness is more powerful than an advocate. An experience will always trump an argument. So when tell, someone tells me, well, how do you know this works? I happen to be a Christian. That's my hang up. But when the service of John the Baptist came to Jesus and said, are you the one that we seek another? He didn't say, wasn't I born on Christmas? <laughs> he healed in their presence and told them, go tell them what you saw. That's what our grassroots leaders do. When you say, I have doubts that this will work, then let me show you somebody who used to be a predator, now they're ambassador of peace. Let me show you a neighborhood that was in decline and now is the safest place. And so there are islands of excellence around America that have been created, but we can't get people to invest, to sustain them and, and, and grow them. And I've written about them in, in but it's very difficult uh, to get people to, to accept what I'm telling you. And so my biggest, I feel like the mythical Cassandra, that I will see the truth, but no one will believe me. Speaking of not belief, I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna read a quote here. The United States is a nation founded on both an ideal and a lie. Our Declaration of Independence, approved on July 4th, 1776, proclaims that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But the white men who drafted those words did not believe them to be true for the hundreds of thousands of black people in their midst. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness did not apply to fully one fifth of the country. Nicole Hannah Jones, 1619 Project. Why is she wrong? The question is, suppose she's right. So what do we do? If you say something is systemically racist and it's in your DNA, where do you go from there? <laughs> she offers no hope and it's just not true. So but, what- But let's, but if I can interrupt, but let's go to the first, we'll get there in a second. Yeah, yeah. So did they mean it? Did they mean it? Yes, I believe that the, that, that founding document, that principle was divinely inspired. Otherwise, why would someone create a document that held their own behavior suspect? Why would someone do that? It doesn't make any sense. That's why I believe it was divinely inspired. And nobody, sh uh, uh, slavery is America's birth defect, but none of us should be defined by the worst that we used to be. America is a nation of redemption. It is a nation of transformation. And so what we did at the Woodson Center, uh, we br brought together some scholars not to offer an alternative argument, but to offer alternative proof that what she wrote about there was not true, that, that Blacks have never been defined by slavery, that when whites were at their worst, we were at their best. As I told you, right after slavery, 
Well, those uh, 75% of black families and the man and woman raising children, uh, we only had 5% of ex-slaves could read. And within 40 years, that number increased to 75%. And when the Freedoms Bureau went south to find out what they could do, the government couldn't do anything because the black churches were, were teaching blacks to read. Never in the history of the world did a people go from 5% literacy to 75% in, in 40 years. And that's because of the attitude of self-determination. Blacks fought in every war that this country ever had and not one was ever found guilty of treason. So was that sacrifice done to, to protect slavery? No. And so, and, and, and let me give you an example in our books about, about the attitude of, of like of oppression. We were never defined by, you know, in, in 1943, there were no black naval officers. Couldn't, couldn't be. Eleanor Roosevelt persuaded her husband to train them. So the Navy set, recruited 16 black men with college education. They're gonna put them through the Naval Training uh, uh, rep Regiment. But the Navy said, oh, we're gonna give these black cadets in eight weeks what we give white cadets in 16 weeks, knowing they'll wash out. So when these brothers found out what the deal was, they covered their windows in the barracks with blankets and stayed up and studied all night. And when they tested, they scored in the 90th percentile. So the Navy said, ah, oh, they cheated. So let's test them individually. They retested them, they scored in the 93rd percentile. It took them six months before they, 13 of them were commissioned. It is the highest score ever made on that in the academy, and that record stands even today. There were uh, five black high schools at the turn of the century in, in New York, Baltimore, Washington, Atlanta, and New Orleans, Dunbar in Atlanta. They had crumbling buildings, used textbooks, half the budgets of white schools. Every one of those black high schools out-tested every white school in those cities. If we could do that under those circumstances when racism was enshrined in law, why are black kids failing in systems today in these cities with the highest per capita? It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with, with, with institutional incompetence and corruption. So I'm gonna push back a little bit on that, right? We've got 250, 1619, 250 years of slavery um, in the United States. We have a hundred years of legal, all kinds of races um, of all different sorts. Um, and then we, we have the civil rights movement and the legal barriers in most cases are, are gone. Right. Voting rights, other basic civil rights. But yet things don't get better, right? This is a, this is a system. Don't get, better, don't get better for whom? To, you just said earlier. To, to you know, I, was on, I was on Jim Lehrer News Hour with Charlie Rangel, um, uh, Merrily Evers, the, the wife of Merrily and John Jacobs of the Urban League. And Jim Lehrer said, Mr. Woodson, what's the state of black America? I said, those up on this panel, we ain't doing bad. <laughs> <laughs> we make more money than most whites. Our children go to the best schools and our income is not going to be adversely affected regardless of which white man is in the White House. <laughs> you cannot generalize about any group of people. All right, I'm gonna quote again. Reparations amount to a societal obligation in a nation where our constitution sanctions slavery, Congress passed laws protecting it, and our federal government initiated, condoned, and practiced legal racial segregation and discrimination against black Americans until half a century ago, all true. And so it is the federal government that should pay reparations. Nicole Hannah Jones. 1619. Sure. Name one people who have ever been delivered from poverty because of reparations. Anywhere in the world. 
if you give people money, they end up spending more than they have and working less. The very, if, if racism were, the, were, were the, 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 the culprit, I don't want to be compared to whites. I want to be compared to black Nigerians because they have better education. Uh, they've accomplished more uh, than whites do. So, so if, if racism were the, were the culprit, then why are not all blacks suffering equally? The biggest income gap is not between whites and blacks, it's, upper in, it's between blacks and blacks. When we were denied access to um, capital in 1929 in the Bronzeville section of Chicago, there were 731 black owned businesses. We have 100 million in real estate assets in Chicago. I could go into to Greenwood, Mississippi, I mean, uh, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, there were black Wall Streets all over this country where blacks, there were five black men in, in 1920 owned their own airplanes in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood section. So only in America can you see this kind of, uh, uh, but let me, this is the very important. Anytime you generalize about a group of people and then try to apply remedies, it always helps those at the top at the expense of those at the bottom, always. Like they talk about women. Which women are you talking about? So what is the solution? Women have been denied access to this and denied, all right. So what, what is the solution? Women should serve on boards of directors. Women should be hired in corporations. What about the black women who are in our prisons being raped by black men who are guards? There was a special two hour documentary on that. It didn't generate any discussion at all because unless a problem is seen through the prism of race, it doesn't generate any support, which means if evil wears a black face visiting harm to black people, it will not get addressed. And, and you're so, so it is, it's important for us not to allow this. This, this is a great country, and, but we must be, be honest with one another about what the solutions are. Nigerians, in fact, people talking about education, all, all kids are failing in our schools. The, 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 other, the other thing that I want to say is that the reason that we must deracialize race Ladies and gentlemen, say that again. We need to deracialize race. Race is a problem, not the whole problem. If you were to look into one room of a house and then define the whole house by what you see in that one room, you would be correct in what you are observing, but you're, you're, you would be incomplete. That's what it's, it, 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 it is like. The biggest crisis facing America today is a moral and spiritual freefall that is consuming our young people in record numbers. The leading cause of death in the black community is homicide. The leading cause of death in Appalachia among whites is prescription drug. And in Silicon Valley, it is teen suicide. It is six times the national average. And so if we are going to address this moral and spiritual freefall, it is because our kids are growing up with a feeling of emptiness in their hearts. And if you feel life has no content or meaning, you will take your life through suicide or take someone else's. It is different sides of the same coin, but we will never get a chance to address that critic and to come up with answers of that if we have to look at each other through the prism of race. If you were a junkie, you're not a brown junkie, a red junkie, or what, you're just a junkie. And, and you need deliverance, you don't need help. See, somebody with a flat tire needs help. Someone who's stuck in the ditch needs deliverance. <laughs> so let me get to some questions. I, I had a question posed to, to me earlier, it's not written down, but it has to do with our vice president's remarks uh, regarding um, hurricane, the hurricane in Florida, and uh, the comment that she made uh, that seemed at the time like policy, or she was stating it as such, that uh, how much money you get in uh, Florida because of your loss in the hurricane will depend on what color you are. 
comment. It is so stupid. It's just hard for me to <laughs> to to even respond. You know, it, it 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 really is. It really is stupid. And, you know, I wish we did have a race problem. It'd be easy to solve. But that is just ridiculous that somehow somebody ought to be held based upon their race. It, 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 it really is silly. And thank God for her because she's making it as trivial as I believe it is. <laughs> Question, is it true that after World War II, African-American men were denied mortgages? Now, I actually know this is true, at least based on race. Yeah, but then well, they were denied mortgage. The question is, where did they get the finances to start 731 businesses in, in Because, and let me just tell you this, we, because we financed our own stuff. You know, in, in Baltimore in 1868, a thousand blacks were fired from the docks for striking. We went to the burial societies and formed the Chesapeake Main Dry Dock and Railroad Company and successfully ran a black owned railroad that ran from Baltimore to Maine for 18 years and hired a thousand people back, including whites. Where did the capital for that come? We had the Divine Lorraine Hotel here. Where did the capital for that come? We had the Mercy Douglas, the black owned hospital. Where did that come from? At the Wallahaji Hotel in Atlanta, the Carver and Calvert Hotels in Overtown, Florida, uh, the St. Teresa in, in New York, uh, the St. Charles Hotel in Chicago, huge. All of these buildings and capital assets were financed primarily by Blacks relying on themselves, like every other group. So it, does, it didn't matter. That it didn't matter that we didn't get mortgages. Yeah, it was unfair. We needed to, but it didn't prevent my mother and father from buying a house as, as, uh, for $4,000. So we bought it because again, we found our own ways of financing it. I mean, this notion that somehow black America is future is tethered to what white America does or does not do is stupid. You know, and also I just think white guilt is white narcissism. <laughs> I am, I am, I, I've decided that I'm going to be certified racial exorcist and I'm going to wave my hand and proclaim all you guilty white folks are absolved from slavery and absolved from Jim Crow all this other stuff that's hanging you up from telling the truth and acting on that truth you tip Bob Woodson absolved me so anybody accuse you but just say hey no he absolved me from that I'm, I'm good so, let's talk about education um education in our, in our in the city of Philadelphia for most of our public school kids in the city of Philadelphia, most of whom are African-American kids, it's terrible educational system that we have. What about school choice? Is this a, is this a possible solution? Can this help? School, not, choice, what's the, what's school the choice is what we have, again, we have models in our essays back in at the turn of the century when blacks in the South the education gap was eighth grade for whites, fifth grade for blacks. Julius Rosenwald, the CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington. Rosenwald put up $4 million. The black community raised 4.8 million and built 5,000 Rosenwald schools in the South. John Lewis and others went to those schools. And as a consequence of those schools, the education gap closed between 1920 and 1940, it closed within six months. The question was if blacks at a time of segregation when, when racism was enshrined in law was able to close the education gap with used textbooks, overcrowded buildings, it has everything to do with self-determination and an attitude of, of, of uh, I think it was Frederick Douglass who said, that the worst time on the plantation was at Christmas because the slave master would give slaves off, but they wanted slaves to define freedom to be self-indulgent. So they made, gave them rum to drink and even had contests of which slave from which plantation could outdrink the other. 
Some slaves bit into that because they then concluded, well, I'm going, I, they're so sick. So by the time the, the six days are over, they'll be rather be slave to man than slave to rum. But other blacks use that time to visit family members. Others use that time to work, to earn money, to buy their freedom. So no matter what oppressive circumstances that confront you, you have the choice to determine what your response to that oppression is. And it's never totally defined by the oppression. So Harvard uh, versus, and this is a case that went to the Supreme Court just last year, um, the Asian students who can't seem to get into Harvard. Uh, talk to me about these, these quotas, these, the system that we've created that does not, it's not merit-based. It's based on something else, including race. Yeah, and again, there, there are examples when you pursue excellence, excellence would be the, the byproduct of excellence is integration. But, if, but what, are you, what are you saying to a people when you say that anytime there is disparity, there's racism? But only if it's negative disparities. Black men are only 6% of the, of the population, but 80% of the NFL <laughs> and 80% of the NBA where the starting salary is something like a half million dollars. But 70% of them are broke within five years. And so it isn't the presence of money or, or, or like that. It's, it's your attitude about it. And that's why I'm not saying, let me, let me just, I have to do my, my, my compulsive, you know, like in the Olympics, you got to do, you can, yes, racism is a problem. It is not the most important problem that we're facing today. You mentioned earlier about investment in these communities. Investment, that's the term you use, enterprise. And, and, and how can people invest in these communities? Well, first of all, people need to understand that, no, that, that most 80% of Blacks poll are against defund the police. 60% poll said that racial discrimination is not the biggest barrier to, to, to human flourishing. And so, but the people that you see on television purportedly representing folks are telling a different story. The problem is even some conservatives are, are often sacrifice old friends to appease old enemies. So you started a new organization. I started the new organization. I mean, the, the Woodson Center, what we have, uh, we have about 3,000 grassroots leaders rate on different racial groups. We have been meeting in retreats and conferences for 40 years and never raised that once did racial animus ever come up. Why? Because 80% of my close friends have letters in front of their names, not in back of them, they X something. <laughs> and they are more concerned about their overcoming their brokenness. And so when you are broken by circumstances and you are interested in learning from others about what is the pathway towards redemption and renewal and revitalization. So what we do at the Woodson Center, when we come together, we don't have time to talk about what our differences are. We come together. And, and so what I'm trying to do is unite the pharaohs and the Josephs of this world. And in, in my book, this is a commercial. <laughs> I wrote a book called The Triumphs of Joseph, where I talk about what is the relationship between the rich and the poor. And it's, it's all laid out in that story. Joseph, as you know, is from a dysfunctional Hebrew family. And they sold him into slavery. And he went to the house of Potiphar, and he became the best servant there. And he was a very handsome, some Potiphar's wife lusted for him. And Joseph refused because he had lateral integrity and horizontal integrity. He said it would be a, a sin against my God and a violation of the trust my master. And she accused him of attempted rape. He went to jail for 13 years, but he came the best prisoner because he remained faithful. He never became bitter or demanded reparations from the Egyptians. 
And, and let me just finish this and then we can go. And so Joseph then was faithful throughout all of this injustice he suffered, but he never became bitter. And so when Pharaoh, though, found out that there were, that there were some troubling uh, issues that he couldn't find, they, and, and he looked to Joseph and they developed a partnership. And a good Pharaoh is somebody who's rich and powerful but who's able to look beyond the, the wealth and the power and look to answers from an uneducated 31-year-old Hebrew shepherd. You're willing to reach across race and class lines to join in partnership with somebody who had the resources to, with the answers. And so that becomes the model of the Woodson Center that we need good pharaohs partnering with good Josephs to restore America. Uh, and so that's the kind of uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the police um, and your organization with the mothers of, of homicide yes. children. Is that correct? Yes, we we take people suffering the problem and look for the solutions among them. Um, several of our, our, our we have a woman named uh, Sylvia Bennett Stone. A 16-year-old daughter, Crystal, was shot to death sitting at a gas station. The bullet went through her and landed in the heart of her best girlfriend sitting next to her. And Sylvia turned her pain into purpose. And we organized the uh, Voices of Black Mothers United. She reached out to these mothers to recruit them, to give them aid and comfort. Now we have thousands of them in 27 states, and they are they are pushing back against defund the police. They're also in five locations working along with the homicide department, the uh, homicide police, so that they remove some of the drama at, the, at, the, uh, at a homicide. And so as a result of establishing relationships between the police, they were able to close more homicides because of the trust that was built up. We are trying to um, give the, the mothers our, our, our are going to do commercials, good cops doing good things. Examples. So we need, we really need to promote good things instead of just complaining about what's bad things have happened. We need to be talking about good things, but we need to be clear about our messengers. These mothers are powerful and we're bringing them together with the moms from Silicon Valley who lost their kids to suicide and also from Appalachia. So we've had a consortium meeting and where we have come. So we got to come together, ladies and gentlemen, around real solutions, not just complaining about what the left is doing, but we've got to demonstrate to the American people that the values of our founders have the consequence of improving the quality of life for people. And so, uh, so we, we believe that rather than just preaching to people, we must demonstrate to them that uh, the God in heaven has created this, this place called America to be a beacon of hope, but we've got to demonstrate through works that it is so. Well, you have been doing that for a long time. You're going, you're retiring from the Woodson Center. What's next for Bob Woodson? Well, you, you retire from a job, but you expire from a calling. <laughs> so I intend to continue to write, to teach. I do a lot of discipling to my young colleagues, teaching them um, in through with the Woodson Principles. I've, I've, it's another commercial, in case you missed it. It's called Lessons from the Least of These. I have a book on Amazon, Lessons. What I've done is taken all the experience that I've had over the years and instilled it into 10 principles that you can follow. How to identify a Joseph. Uh, and I lay that out. So part of what I want to do for, for in this last quarter of my life <laughs> is to help inspire people that people are motivated to change and improve when you show them victories that are possible, not injuries to be avoided. And someone said, if you, 
if you want to go someplace you haven't been, you got to be willing to do something that you haven't done. And George Bernard Shaw said that must ask the rhetorical question, must a, die, a Christ die in torment at every age to save those that lack imagination? Ladies and gentlemen, we just lack imagination, but we must inspire one another and not get hung up on what our differences are. And so I'm hoping to use whatever God has left for me to inspire people like you to come together with my Joseph's and let's retake this country. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Bob Wilson. Bob, thank you. Thank you.